Hi guys and welcome to Chairboys1887. You may notice I'm joined by Russell Thomas again. We are uh, we're going to conclude the interview uh, from previous and, uh, and we're also going to, to talk about some, some other things hopefully coming up in the future with Moving On TV. So Russell, um, first of all, I'd like to officially welcome you as a co-host of Chairboys1887. Thank, 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 thank you very much for, uh, for coming on. Um, how do you how do you feel? Um, what's what's the why why first of all did you, did you agree to to coming on to um, on to Chairboys Eight Nine Seven? First of all, I am very privileged that you asked me to begin with. Um, I think anything to do with a football club where we can get it out, you know, and uh, get it some good publicity. Of course, anything we can do, fantastic. I'm more than happy to help. Brilliant. Give up some time. Okay. More than happy. And anything to make the show better, to achieve that goal, fantastic. I'm all in for it. If there was, if there was a, an overriding message, you now you've been on the program. This is obviously your second time being on. Um, for those that maybe are, are a bit sceptical about um, about coming on or, or sharing their their stories, um, their experiences about the club, um, in in just a, a little little couple of uh, words, what would you say? What would you say to those supporters that, that are wanting to come on but, but aren't quite sure? It's nothing to fear. Um, again, providing you can uh, make some time to come on. Uh, I was certainly was made to feel very welcome. Um, regardless of uh, you know your history with the club or your background, you know, no one will be discriminated against. No. Um, it's basically just about uh, being given the platform to share your ideas and opinions. And that's basically it, really. There's nothing Brilliant. really to fear. Okay. Um, as, as Russell says, there, there is nothing to, to fear. Um, we don't buy. Um, we're, there, is, there is literally nothing to fear. There, there are certain aspects of the club that we can't discuss just because, um, partly because we don't know the answers ourselves. And that's why we can't discuss it. And also, um, the club have, have sort of said that there's there's a few things that, that we can't discuss. Um, partly because maybe the club don't know the answers themselves either. Um, but anyway, leaving that behind. Um, thank you, thank you again, Russell, for, for agreeing to, to be part of the program. Um, so when we when we finished uh, previous the, the previous program, we we were talking about your your all time favourite Chairboys Eleven. Um, we we'd started off by by covering um, part of the the back four um, or the back five I should say um, Paul Hiding goal uh, Jason Cousins right back Terry Evans um, was one of the centre backs so if we resume uh, the two remaining players in the back four um, Glenn Creaser why why was he he chosen uh, for those people that don't uh, don't know him or never seen him play. Why, why was he? Creaser, um, a generation before probably a lot of a lot of supporters here would know. Would yeah, recognize. myself included. Um, very similar in the mould to Terry Evans, an old fashioned centre half. Yeah. No messing around, get your head in, get your foot in, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, the leader of the side that won the conference um, he was basically Martin O'Neill's um, projection on the pitch mm. and goal scoring threat and very sadly missed when he had his accident at work with a forklift but That's kept nice. him out. Um, fantastic centre half. Cool. Okay. Um, what was, would you say, uh, apart from obviously lifting things, at, uh, lifting trophies at, at Wembley, uh, I think is what I'm saying. Uh, lifting trophies at, at Wembley and obviously lifting the conference as well. Um, what what would you say was there maybe a defining moment or, or a moment where you thought, okay, this this guy is a, a, a hardcore chairboy? I don't think there would be a defining moment, but I think 
the fact that he was integral integral in the part he played within the actual structure of the side. Yeah. You know, they say that you know um, your centre forwards will win matches, mm -hmm. but your defence will win your championships. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, and uh, the back line of that conference winning side was as good as any we've ever had. Yeah. And he was the sort of, um, you know, he was the rock in that. When, when he wasn't playing, um, obviously he had the accident at, at work, um, with the forklift, was there, could you see that he was missed? Uh, was it obvious that he wasn't there? The most obvious thing about him was his aerial ability, obviously his sheer height, he was yeah. roughly about the same height as Terry Evans, 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, that would be the most obvious thing, and the organisation and leadership skills on the pitch would obviously be missed as well. Of course. We were blessed to have um, some wonderful defenders back then, Andy Kerr, Matt Crossley, mm. and yeah. uh, so it was almost like it, you know, the void was filled. You know, it, it wasn't, you know, the, uh, the, cata the catastrophe that it could be yeah, you know, of today course, yeah. if we lost someone like Aaron, for mm. example. Yeah, there's there's no one really in there to, to come in. Okay, um, Mickey Bell. What's um, what was the what was the reason for, for picking him? Um, obviously, there's there's a, a load of left backs that, that we've had over the years. Um, Jacobson, Woodman, uh, to name yeah, a few. Vinicum, yeah, Vinicum. Yeah, Vinicum. Yeah. We've been blessed. Um, I think the one thing that he had over all the others was he was not only was he a great defender um, yeah. he wasn't actually um, a left back to begin with when he came here he was actually a winger okay. uh, he was converted to a wing back slash left back I presume probably because Steve Guppy was yes. was left wing there was no chance he was going to play there uh, uh, he actually came when Guppy had left oh, so okay. they, they never actually uh, crossed paths oh ok fair enough but um, he was Possibly the best best defender on the wing at the club. Okay. Um, he was put there. Uh, basically, we switched to like a back five or wing back, mm -hmm. so that sort of fit in. Yeah. And he would go on and attack uh, the opposition fullback from deep. Okay. He's the best player I've ever seen. Possibly on either flank to, to take the ball and run at people and you know, run into the sort of danger areas and deliver good balls. Very good cross through the ball, good athlete and a very good defender as well. Um, with all the uh, full backs we've had since, again great defenders but they haven't had that uh, attacking threat that he had. He would get by people and he would cause problems very quick and could deliver a wonderful ball. Sure, okay. Um... The next one, Jesus. Dave Carroll. One of the most talented footballers I've ever seen live. Didn't look like a footballer. Um, he couldn't really win anything in the air. He wasn't the best at winning the ball. But the guy just never seemed to lose the ball. It seemed to be stuck to his feet. And he had this amazing ability just to ghost past players, like an infinite, infinite amount of players and obviously once you've got the other side of them they can't touch you mm. and some of the most memorable goals I've ever seen were scored by him just by going past players yeah. um, he was almost what you would class sort of like an outside right the old fashioned position and he would drift in right. okay. yeah, as yeah. well but um, wonderful footballer and again um, almost a dying breed. Would you would you say maybe he's he's a different breed to to what the the outside or the side midfielders were in that day? I mean, most of the time it was just cross, 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 cross. But the game has evolved, doesn't it? So um, I suppose he was maybe in in that sort of time where it was changing. The, the, in those days, your full backs very rarely would join the attack and overlap. Um, it was sort of a no-no, mm. you know, and then, because obviously what would happen is the, the, the wide players would tuck in mm. and then the full backs would go outside. Um, that was sort of unheard of back yeah. then. Okay. Um, and it would hinder his, you know, where he'd need to be on the pitch to do the most damage if they did. Yeah. Um, but um, I think, could a player like that play today? Yes, of course he could, um, but you would have to play to his strengths as well.
Um, the, the one thing I've noticed from the players that we are going to mention, and a lot of the players today, there's not really anyone in the side who can make something happen out of nothing. You know, they get the ball and you, you're on the edge of your seat, something's going to happen. You know, when there's a... Good or bad. Yeah, when there's like a game where it's like a nothing game and you can't really see a goal coming, there's no one on that pitch who can just get the ball and just make something happen. Mm. And that's probably one of the shortcomings of the current side at the moment. Okay. If, um, so after Dave Carroll left, uh, the end of 2001? I believe it was around that time. Yeah. Um, was there, has there any been, has there been anyone since who thought is the next Dave Carroll that we've had? The only one I could really think would come close would be Darren Curry. Mm, yeah. Okay. A very, very good footballer. Right. Some would say he was a bit lazy, um, but his ability with both feet, he could shoot. Crossing was fantastic. Um, his balance was terrific. He could fool defenders with just the simplest mm -hmm. drop of the shoulder. We've not had a player like that since. He was almost too good to be at the level he was playing at. Mm. But of his shortcomings for the rest of his game, obviously, wouldn't allow him to perform at a higher level. Mm. But for what he did have, it was very entertaining to watch yeah. and okay. created numerous chances for us. And now we go on to... Possibly the two, or two of, the four players who I, who I sort of instantly recognised as, as my favourite players. Um, the other two we'll, we'll come on to, which funnily enough you've picked as well. Mm -hmm. um, Keith Ryan and Steve Brown. If we start off with uh, Keith Ryan first, mm -hmm. um, what, was, what was your overriding thoughts on, on the career he had at, at Wickham? Same as Dave Carroll, um, to stay at a club for that long and to perform at the level he did for so long and he had to adapt his game as well in the later years. Yeah. Wonderful servant, mm. I know he still lives locally at Flackle Heath yeah. and um, probably one of the most influential and effective midfielders we've had or I've certainly seen. Yeah. Um, not what you would consider a flash footballer but his job was to break the play up and in his younger days he would uh, almost be like a box-to-box -box midfielder. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he actually came here, I believe, as a striker, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, Martin O'Neill saw something about him where he could basically patrol the midfield and do a job and he was probably the most effective midfielder we had. And he fought his way into the side, got in front of Gary Smith, who was ageing at the time, took his spot. And yeah, from, that, from that point yeah. on, he remained in the side, and then, of course, uh, became skipper, and he, rightfully so. There was a period of time where um, I think it might have been John Gregory actually made him a part of the back three, a centre half. Done okay. a done a very good job there, right. but again, you just didn't quite. Wasn't that kind get, of player? Um, no, he was great in the. He could play anywhere on the pitch and do a job for you. Mm. But there was something missing when he was there. He just wasn't, you know, Keith Ryan in the midfield was, you know, getting the best out of him. Yeah. But he was eventually moved back into the midfield mm. later on. Okay. Um, the next one, Steve Brown, Brownie. I love Steve Brown. I think he's fantastic. Um, again, hard as nails. Not the greatest footballer in the world. But he was there to win the ball and be a pain in the backside. Yeah. Big bloke, six foot plus, built like a tank. And mm. again, another player who would easily fit into the current side. Covered every blade of grass, you know, and never gave you a second rest. Yeah. And I had the privilege of seeing him play up at Holber Green a few years ago now in uh, like a Wickham Legends oh, versus yeah. Holden yeah. Green game yeah. and he must have been he must have been in his late 40s and he was still running around like he was 20 it was fantastic absolutely brilliant and um, doing quite well uh, with the FA as well yes um, good and uh, it's uh, and he could also strike a football as well oh yeah he could strike a football 
Colchester. Um, and there are a few others to come to mind as well. Um, I think the that game, the game where he scored that absolute belter against Colchester was probably the first time I actually sat, uh, sat up and, and took note of it. Um, not just for that goal, mm. but the o the over all round play of him in that game. All right, um, Steve Guppy. Let's uh, let's let's take a take a bit of time talking about him because there's so much to talk about. Um, what a player! Of all the players we've had in what you would call the modern era, he's the one who went on and sort of you know got all the accolades. He got the England cap. Mm. How he didn't get a run in the England side at the top of his mm. game is totally beyond me. Because there wasn't many players in that era that who would play. I mean, yeah. cons I mean, Alan Shearer would, was the old-fashioned centre forward. And, you know, they say that balls into the box of quality are what forwards dream of. Mm. You've got David Beckham on the other side. You know, obviously he's got the notoriety of yeah, Manchester of United. Yeah. And you've got Guppy at the less fashionable club, who I might add are on the verge of winning the Premier League. And exactly. I actually hope they do. I yeah. really hope they do. Oh, yeah. I think that will give English football a breath of fresh air it needs. Mm -hmm. um, without digressing too much, yeah, um, he was... He was very quick in his younger days, great deliverer of a ball, and had no fear of running at people. He would just get the ball and he, he would run at people and you know look to get outside of them, get that yard and get that ball in. And, and then, he was so sorry, effective at, he was so effective at it. And he scored the best goal I've ever seen at this ground. Run call? Yes. There you go. And I'm sure See, you've I'm sure um, you've seen oh, it. Oh I've seen it countless oh, times. I'll yeah. tell you what. And again, another when we break these days, when a player's got the chance to just run into space, they're almost hesitant to run into it. Mm. Maybe he, overthinking? Possibly. Yeah. Or just the fear of not knowing what to do. Yeah. But he just got the he picked the ball up on the edge of our area, ran the full length of the pitch, and once he got there, he had the um, frame of mind to wait for the keeper to basically commit, and then he just dinked it over him into the net. It was a wonderful goal. I, I haven't seen a goal better than that on this ground. Um, obviously, I, I probably wasn't, I definitely wasn't around when that goal was scored, but I've seen it countless number of times. Um, okay, the the third out of the, the four people that I, that I definitely picked in, in my team, um, Keith Scott. What um, what is the what's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of, of Keith Scott? Mm -hmm. Keep it clean. <laughs> Bear it in mind. A player that you just don't see anymore. Mm. A great target man who, in his first spell with a club, was very mobile. Shoot on sight, and his attitude on the pitch you could see like he was enjoying himself mm. and he was he, he was like the perfect outlet in a game where things weren't going well if you needed to hit the ball 20 yards you know to get it to stick he was your man were you there uh, when he when he first started at the club yes yeah uh, he was signed from Lincoln reserves uh, I think it was 1991 90, something like that yeah um, at the time uh, the forwards we had at the time, I think, I think Nicky Evans had gone back to Barnet, and we had a player here. Um, his name escapes me for the moment. That's okay. But he was basically an understudy, just Keith Scott. Yeah. And um, Scotty came in, and it was a breath of fresh air. It was that something that we were we were missing. The Martin O'Neill setup sort of revolved around a target man in the side, and he fit the bill very well. And he was very popular with the supporters. Yeah. You could see that when he came back for his second stint at the club back in '96. Mm. Not quite the player he was. Mm. The mobility was beginning to leave, and um, he was almost a little bit more one-dimensional. But he came in and virtually saved the club from relegation. Possibly a little bit like Hayes, would you say? Different player. Different, um, completely different. Paul, Paul Hayes. His game is based on dropping out of the box and linking the player. Okay. Um, Keith Scott was a player who would get in the box and he would be so the completely target. opposite. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right. Mark West, Westy. Uh, local legend. Um, if you speak to anybody 
of 30 years old plus who Mark West is, they'll tell you that he was a goal scoring machine. Um, I live two minutes away from his mum, so I, I, I speak to her regularly. So uh, He was virtually the Gary Lineker of non-league football. Um, okay. So was he a name before he came? To the best of my knowledge, he had trials at West Ham, didn't make the grade. Uh, he played for High Wycombe School Boys when they won uh, the national competition. Okay. Uh, and he eventually found a home here at Wickham, his hometown club. Um, so he had a little bit of notoriety in that sense. Um, but through his entire tenure here, he scored goals. You know, the service was always good. And, you know, you stick it in the box. If, it, if the ball falls into a bit of space, he was always there. Goal. No messing around, goal. No. Easy. Uh, he was the club's penalty taker for a long time, and I think I've only ever seen him miss one, maybe two. One of the coolest penalty takers we've ever had. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And I think he's like the fourth, or maybe the fifth all time highest goal scorer in the club's history. All right. Very good knowledge if, uh, if that is the case. Um, all right, let's, let's sum it up. Um, I'm going to ask you to pick captain and probably a, a bit of an easier choice would be a manager it's probably going to be the easiest choice you'll ever have to make it's almost not us it's, it's, it's almost not it's, us it's, it's, it's my idea isn't it? it yeah it has to be yeah yeah okay um you get certainly long odds for somebody else yeah if, if uh, it's, uh, you know as much as i love gareth and you know what he's had to do on a shoestring yeah it's got to be. To, to, you know, Martin O'Neill brought this club so much success, it's not even a, you know, it's almost yeah. laughable question. You know. <laughs> okay, no worries. But, um, Skipper. The Skipper. captain, that's tough. That's very tough. That depends on what side of the bed I've woken up on. No worries. It's either Terry Evans or Glyn Creaser. Okay. Um, both would be fantastic. They're both a leader of men. They're great organisers. And when things aren't going well, you turn to them and they G you up. I, I, I honestly couldn't pick between the two. Co-captains. There you go. That's uh, Keith Ryan. Keith Ryan as well. Yeah. Again, similar mould. Um, Would you possibly say that the it's such a difficult choice because they were all the same type of character. They were they were all skippers. I think. I think when you look at the game of football. When you're on the pitch, it's all about your personality and the way you convey yourself mm. and the way you carry yourself. Um, obviously, the skipper's armbands, you lead the team out. And yeah. You've then, by law, the football yeah. rules got the uh, right to talk to the manager, uh, so, excuse me, talk to the referee, the officials. Um, if you're a vocal player, you'll be vocal, you don't need the armbands. Mm. You know? um, obviously, you're constantly giving information constantly geeing up your players yeah. around you so um, not the biggest issue in the world because I think the players out there a big majority yeah. of them will do the job okay all right then um, very very good I, I'm very impressed with that um, there's a lot of those players that I must say uh, are in mine um, we can talk about my one um, at a later date uh, once I get rid of all the ones you've copied. <laughs> no. Um, or I try and put together one that can compete with, uh, with that, which will be very interesting. In fact, I will try. Uh, the next time we convene, I will pick an 11 that has none of those players in it. Okay. That, that's my challenge. That's interesting. So, you, uh, you heard it here first. I'm going to try and pick an 11... That try that will attempt to compete with that, and uh, and that will be your first interview. Will be me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's wrap that up a bit. What we are going to continue talking about is um, Laurie Sanchez and the the final the final sort of days and, and months of, of his tenure in in charge of this club. Um, the the poor poor results. Poor football, and Sanchez turns on the supporters. 
The one thing I remember with Laurie Sanchez, once the cup run had come to its conclusion, we never took the next step and then went on to consolidate in the division and then went on to challenge to get into the old Division 1, which is now the Championship. Um, why, why, why do you think that was? Um, From obviously an outside point of view, why, why with do you the, think? I think with the squad we had in the FA Cup run, it was an aging side and it needed um, refreshing up. The players who came in just didn't quite produce what was needed to get the results. Yeah. And Laurie Sanchez was very um, stern in his methods. Um, he was a very direct, you know, very long ball, and a lot of the games were very um, unattractive to watch. Mm. And, you know, regardless of how you look at it, football is a business, and your clients yeah. hell, do want to be entertained. I do understand results come first, yeah. but when the results aren't coming, and the football isn't pleasing on the eye. Football support is generally quite fickle. Mm. I'll hold my hand up as well. I'm no different. And Manchester United being one, I suppose, in, in the current mm -hmm. current climate. Okay. Um, what was what was your overriding emotion or your overriding thoughts when the 2001 season, or, or sorry, the the last season that Laurie Sanchez was there? Um, or when, when he left, what was your overriding emotion when he had gone? Um, I think as we touched on before, nothing really lasts forever. Mm. Um, the original five year plan they had, or three year plan, whatever it was, um, it didn't really come to fruition, so then they're sort of left with sort of peripheral egg on their faces, you know, where do we go from here? Um, and we just became, became a, also ran a Division One side. Um, Wickham supporters have been quite spoiled in the last 25 years, so once your, um, you know, once success is sort of uh, given to you, once it's taken away, it's sort of a bit of a pill to swallow. Uh, Laurie Sanchez sensed that the supporters were slowly beginning to turn on him um, at a few uh, fans' forums and various other media outlets. He was uh, quite hostile in the way he approached them. Um, and eventually the supporters eventually turned on him and I would guess Ivor Beek said enough was enough, we need to freshen things up. Okay, alright. Fair enough. That's, um, I suppose that, that's sort of the, the thing that does happen with, with clubs like this one, um, who do treasure the, the opinions and, and things of the supporters mm -hmm. and, and realise that if a manager isn't liked, or if he isn't producing results, or if he isn't playing a certain way that the supporters like, then, mm -hmm. then he's got to go. Um, Wickham Wanderers have always traditionally been a football inside, all the way back to you know the non-league days, well before I was born. So there's always been a culture of you know, the, you know this is the way we play, and we shouldn't deviate from it too much. Um, obviously, Gareth has been in the spotlight with regards to certain things, you know, methods, mm. but on the other hand, if you're getting the results, you can excuse it, it's just when you're not getting the results, people are quite quick to bite. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk about the the much uh, much talked about arrival of London Wasps, or Wasps as they're now known, uh, currently situated in Coventry. What were what were the thoughts about them them coming in at first? At the beginning, I never really had an opinion. I've never been a rugby guy. Um, I know High Wycombe traditionally has had a good rugby following. Yeah, it always has done, as far as I've been aware. Um, at the beginning, you think, great, we've got a tenant who can pay us some money to sort of keep us afloat, slash, yeah. you know, give us some money. Yeah, of course. Um, the funny thing was, um, with the financial climate, a lot of people in High Wycombe were then torn between can we go and see the football club or can we go and see the rugby. Um, it was strange because you know, you're in a transition where the next generation of the supporters, are they going to latch on to the football club or not? And now here you've got a top flight rugby side playing you know, mm. some of the best rugby in the country and it was almost like, you know, I'll go and see the rugby, you know. Yeah. And it is technically like watching Premiership football. 
Mm. I think what you would, I mean, you're, you're always, your hardcore support will be there to watch the grass grow of about one and a half thousand people. They'll be there forever, you know, they'll watch the team play against shadows, you know. Yeah. But what you would consider your floating supporters who would pop in for a big game or, you know, you know they would cherry pick their games, they've then been given the option of another, you know, sporting contest. So, you know, those floating supporters then slowly started to go and watch the rugby. And for whatever reason, we never gained those people back. Mm. Okay. Um, so, was there, there may be a time during that period that, that wasps were here um, where you thought, apart from the money side, um, was it having an impact, a good impact anywhere else? With regards to on the field, um, not that I would be aware Probably of. Probably not. No. Um, obviously they're their own entity, all they're basically doing is they're a tenant for our, uh, they're sharing our ground. Mm. Yeah. Um, the pitch then would become a problem, it would just become boggy and it would need to be relayed, which again costs money. Mm. So in effect, even though they're giving us money, they're actually creating extra problems. Yeah. Um, again, nothing that I say is out of bitterness or anything like that, it's yeah, just course. only what I know. Yeah, okay, no worries. Um, Alright, let's leave, uh, let's leave the, the wasps, uh, the wasps alone. Um, in the, the sort of time period that, that Wasps were here um, on the pitch for the football club, what was, what was it sort of, was it maybe lacking direction? We weren't sure whether we were, what, what we were trying to achieve in, in the vision, is that, is that correct? Or? Um, well, success is always the priority. You, you, know, you never set out a season to say we're just going to you know, plod along and see what happens. You know, regardless of what they say through the media, Players want to go out there and perform and win matches. You know, it's just human nature and competitiveness. I think we, as I touched upon before, we are in a process of transition where we were looking just to set up a new side and continue going in the direction the club yeah. wanted to go. Obviously, you know, you make mistakes in that regard, and obviously everybody else is moving forward. When you take a step back, it's very frustrating. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the, the 2001 side, um, obviously reaching the FA Cup semi-finals and, and all the rest of that, was the um, the sort of the the incomings and outgoings of, of the older players um, as big as it was to be expected, or was there sort of a, a group of maybe four or five players who all went at the same time? Or I think at the end of the I think the next season. Um, the youth team at the time was still, you know, starting to then become successful. You know, Roger Johnson came in, and uh, the some of the older players naturally were sacrificed as their best mm -hmm. days were now behind them. And the the young players came in and they started to get experience. And it was basically, for whatever reason, we just never hit the heights we expected. Okay. Um. With the, the youth team in that current era, mm -hmm. or in that era, I should say, was there sort of maybe four or five players every year who were promoted into the youth team? Was it, if you're good enough, you're in? It wasn't quite like that. Um, but I think basically they were all on, um, I think it's changed now, but they were on uh, apprenticeships, and uh, two-year apprenticeships. Uh, once they completed their second year, uh, they were evaluated if they felt that they had progressed to the point where they could play a part, they were brought into the side and then the rest would then be released, found a new club and then re-nurtured at Pastures New. Um, the players who did come in did a solid job and you could see the seeds for you know the future with the, the just last generation of players who've left us. Um, and a fair few of them who did come in um, with the exception of one or two, went on and made a, you know, a, a fair career for themselves. Are there, is there um, anyone that you can remember who has done that? Um, I think of that era, Roger Johnson was possibly, and Mike Williamson were the ones who 
went on to get the most notoriety. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Was Was there anybody from from the youth team that didn't make the grade at the club and, and has applied their trade and, and successfully applied their trade at any anywhere? I think you would have to go back just a step a few steps before um, we had the most notable one was Jason Roberts who was at the youth team for right. a season and he was released. I think it might have been under John Gregory okay. and uh, I dare not really say this but he was told and I quote you'll never make a footballer as long as you have a hole in your you know what. Okay. Right. Um, again that's, that's interesting. you're never you're never gonna get it a hundred percent spot on because you don't know how the player is gonna you know you know once they get to a certain age you don't know if they're gonna make it or not. They have to do, you know do the business. Kachienya would have been another one released very lightweight and he went over to the Glen Hoddle Academy over in Spain. Yeah. He was given a new position as a forward, and all of a sudden it just clicked for him. Played in Spain for a while, came back, and now uh, he's on the books of Watford as a basically a wing back on either flank, and he's got himself into the Scotland side. Yeah. So you just don't know how things yeah. are going to progress. True. Okay then. Um, so players, uh, the more memorable players of, of that time period were. Sean Devine, yeah. um, Jermaine McSporran, um, probably most notably for, for the Guinness Book of Records goal. Yeah, um, I, I remember that game very well actually. It's just, um, I remember Jamie Bates had a who, free kick. Who was the other player who scored the... Jamie Bates and McSporran were the goal scorers. Right. Uh, it was literally on the stroke of half time, Jamie Bates had a free kick, just slightly off centre, um, just outside the box. 20 yards, no more than that, and he would literally just stick his foot through it and smash the ball, and oh, it went through the wall, goalkeeper didn't move, got the goal, and literally the whistle was blown as the ball went in the net, or just after the goal had been scored. Okay, so. fair enough. Uh, and then uh, we tried a new routine from the kickoff in the second half, um, the ball was laid off to McSporran, who knocked it past the initial oncoming challenger from the first player, ran past another one or two, all of a sudden he found himself in on goal and just calmly just passed it into the goal and we're two nil up. In fact, I, I nearly missed it because oh, right. I was literally just looking at the programme. Yeah. I heard the sort of cheer go on like this and I looked up, oh goal, oh fantastic, two nil. <laughs> it was weird. Blimey. It was strange. All right. Um, so Jermaine McSporran and Jamie Bates, I think, um, Jamie Bates has, has still got um, he's either second or or highest uh, appearance maker at Brentford. Um, yeah, again, players like that which you is, don't see anymore. It's just outstanding for for a player like that to, to still be like, like really high up in in the um, in the, the making like that. I think it shows you um, how the game is today, though. Mm. You know, with players coming in and out of clubs. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, hopefully Mr. Bloomfield will stay on for a, another few years. Um, I think with the form he's been in, in the last few months, he's almost reinvigorated himself. Yeah. He, he, he was almost getting to the point where you felt like he was like you know on his last legs, mm -hmm. and the club stuck with him through a bad time when he was injured, and he's come on and he's done a good job. Again, not the most spectacular player, but he will do the job for you. And he, I think he's earned himself an extension. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, one of the other players we've we've already spoken about, um, Darren Curry, um, was part of that era as well. I mean, what was the the sort of overriding um, overriding emotion about him? I know we've spoken mm -hmm. a little bit about him, if, but if you want to just yeah, I think just to add to it, I think he was one of the most technically gifted players we've had. Great first touch, yeah. could cross with either foot, and I think with what he gave the team, I still think to this day we never utilised him as much as we should have. Yeah. I think under Laurie Sanchez, a lot of the game would be the ball would just go over his head. Okay. We and we we really should have given him the ball more. Everything we did to create opportunities would invariably come through him in the final third. Okay. And. 
for it not to be utilised was such a shame. Because, you know, when he was released, to go up a division, yeah. just told you everything you needed to know. And we'll come on to that mm. yeah, shortly. Um, Alright. The I suppose the one of the most controversial periods of Wasps being at Adams Park was the, the naming rights to the stadium being sold off um, to to a local company um, for about 100,000 and um, they renamed it the Causeway Stadium. What was your initial thought? I, I can't really express what, I'm a what my thoughts were. Um, I'm a tradition person. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what people want to say, the football club has got a heritage and a history. If it wasn't for Frank Adams and what he did with giving the deeds over to Lokes Park to us, we possibly wouldn't be in existence. Yeah. To basically to basically spit on that and slap it in the face, I think was disgraceful. Um, at the time, I don't think we were in a position where we really needed the money. I think we almost prostituted ourselves off just for a quick buck, and I was not in favour of it. No. Um. And it's almost like saying next season we're going to be we're going to change our strip and play in red like Cardiff did. Yeah, I think that's yeah. disgraceful. Yeah. Um, okay then. With um, with that, obviously, became uh, well, there was a, a managerial change. Um, John Gorman taking um, taking temporary charge, mm -hmm. um, and then Tony Adams. Yeah, uh, when Gorman came in, Tony Adams was brought in as like they were what you would call co-managers. Okay. Um, now Gorman being the more dominant of the two. I don't know exactly how it worked. Um, how how did it look? How 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 did it look? It was very brief. It was yeah. literally a few games. Um, to be honest, we were winning games, so you don't really question it. But looking back on it, in any in any walk of life where you know there's seniority or in any job there has to be one boss mm. you know you can't have two because there will be a clash of opinions um, obviously the club eventually went for Tony Adams full time um, looking back at it was that a mistake um, in hindsight yes it was due to how it ended um, the club obviously saw pounds and pence in front of them Tony Adams had just retired you know, it's a name, you know, it's a recognised name in the world of football. No it, managerial experience either. No, it will get none at all. It will get the, and I think he was just in the process of doing his badges. Um, you know, regardless of the personal problems aside, you know, he had his demons, but that's nothing to do with this no. in particular. Um, I think the club saw a chance to get national media. And once that sort of honeymoon period had disappeared and the reality had set in, Tony Adams was feeling his way around. He'd done what he could in training to get the best out of what he had, but he was almost working almost blind through his lack of experience. Um, at the end of the season, I remember the side was basically stripped apart. We had virtually six players on the books. The amount of players we lost, I couldn't believe it. It was almost like Alan Smith all over again. So any work that was done through the previous two or three years yeah. to build the side up had just been thrown in the toilet. Mm. Um, and then the players who were brought in just weren't up to standard. And once Tony Adams felt that, you know, he was on the verge of the push, he just resigned. He just didn't turn up one day. Um, again, I wouldn't want to judge the man personally, but no. you know, from what I saw from my own experience on the football pitch, we were left in a bit of a quagmire. Okay, um, I think that we have, have reached a, a bit of a, a point there where we can where we can stop and, and have a bit of a break. So um, please do have a look at the commercial break because there will be some some good things in there for you to look at.
pay the money and go to Australia. You can get the CD. It's the best show I've seen in Japan. Absolutely wonderful show. The singing was absolutely beautiful. Lauren basically is Edith Piaf. Please go and see. My name is Lauren Hopo Medal, and together with Jacob Creswick, we have founded Moving On TV. Now, Moving On TV is going to be a great new type of media. It's about you, it's about the community, it's about all of us coming together as one. The thoughts I have of you, you're all my name is Lauren and I'm here to present you with some really happy stories that I found on the internet to help us have a better life. And I'm also looking for your stories. I am looking for your stories. Good evening everyone and welcome to our holistic show. I try to follow all the cycles of the night. Up and down the feelings go, I know it is right. Wickham Hospital, I've started a petition. Hi guys and welcome back to Chairboys 1887. Um, Russell, the new co-host of Chairboys 1887, is is here with me. Um, thank you very much again, uh, Russell, for for agreeing to to be part of this um, growing program um, to do with the the best club in Buckinghamshire. Um, let's let's talk a, a bit about the. Uh, we've we finished uh, before the break by talking about the um, the period where Adams uh, Tony Adams resigned um, from the club. Let's talk about um, when when John Gorman came in. What was the the overriding emotion from yourself um, and from fellow supporters that, that you know um, about his um, uh, about his arrival? The initial appointment. Um, well, first of all, he was he had a wealth of experience. He worked as Glenn Helton's number two at Swindon Town when they got into the Premier League. Uh, also, England's experience under Glenn Hoddle as well during the '98 World yeah. Cup. Um, he virtually ticked all the boxes required to turn around what was left by Tony Adams. And once we saw what he did with the football club, we played some of the most attractive, eye-pleasing football. I've seen ever, including Martin O'Neill's reign here. Wonderful football to watch, unbelievable amount of chances and games, and how we didn't manage to attract more supporters to the ground is beyond me. It was wonderful. Um, nothing bad to say about the style of football, it's fantastic. The, uh, the 21 match unbeaten start, I think, is still. The, the longest we've gone um, unbeaten. The start of the Peter Taylor era did run it close, I think that was 18 games. Yeah. 
Um, I do. Certainly within modern history, anyway. Yeah, um, 21 matches unbeaten is, is phenomenal. Considering it's a 46 game mm -hmm. league season, that's pretty much half the season. Um, which was phenomenal. There was a period of time that year where we literally looked invincible. I honestly thought we could walk this league and win it unbeaten. It literally looked like it was close to a formality. Mm. Um, eventually the defeat did come. Fair enough, we were on track. As far as I was concerned, we were promoted. Mm. Um, the unfortunate um, incident that occurred that basically derailed the side yeah. um, um, with Mark Philo. Yeah, that was. I think that was sort of the, the time where I, li I had um, become a, a lifelong supporter was, was that sort of time. Um, I didn't know what to think to start off with because I was new to the whole aspect of, mm. of football. Um, 2006, I was seven uh, when that happened, um, or pushing seven. Um, what was the the week like? Well, we got back home. That. We got back home from the Notts County game, and a friend of mine who lived over the road from me at the time came, and knocked on my door, and he said, "You heard the news." So we were talking about my well, Mark Philo died in a car crash, and he died um, in the hospital during the game. Mm. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And we basically, you know, it was a shock. And um, once it came to light the circumstances behind it and what the uh, the accident caused, it killed a mother of two and it was actually found out that he was actually over the limit mm. driving um, some of his mates to or from a nightclub. Once that's sort of come out it's extremely difficult to have any sympathy for the boy. Um, it was just a foolish thing and he yeah. paid the ultimate price for it. Of yeah. course um, his family you just grieve for, you know, at the end of the day he was still somebody's son. Yeah, um, and and then of course a few the, weeks after that the team collapsed, it just, you know, from an almost invincible yeah. position, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of someone, you know, where you work, if someone who is dear to you, you see every day, is just not there anymore, Yeah. then you, you just can't, you know, there's no yeah. way you can just like carry on, you know, you no. put, even though you have to, yeah. but your mind is just in the clouds. So I can understand why the season mm. is derailed. And, and that then, coupled with uh, yeah. John Gorman's wife's passing after her uh, after her illness. Yeah, that's just uh, another... And he went on uh, gardening leave, as we say. Yeah. That was extremely controversial, and Steve Hayes was here at the time. I was incensed when I found out, because... I honestly thought John Gorman was the guy to take us in the next division okay. and it was officially um, said that he was left, it, he was relieved of his duties because he was um, unable to you know, mentally commit himself to the job. Now I don't want to put my foot in my mouth by saying this but through hearsay and through what I hear from a few sources of mine, um, it was allegedly reported that he had a very heavy drink problem and with the uh, aforementioned things it basically mm. escalated it even further. It was never reported by the club of course because they obviously don't want to associate themselves with something like that and it was basically brushed under the carpet. Whether that's true or not, I could never confirm it but it was a heavily discussed topic at the time. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and obviously we'd we don't know the full ins and outs um, of it, uh, whether whether anything like that is true. Um, so that's that's the end of, of that. Um, after he'd gone, um, after John Gorman had left, Paul Lambert. Um, obviously, I presume you knew who he was. Yeah, before. Um, just a few short years before, he had won the Champions League with Borussia Dortmund. Mm -hmm. So. It was fresh in the memory of who he was. Yeah. Uh, again, Scotland international. Uh, couldn't understand the word he said. No. I've um, still can't. He came in. Um, he basically had his own, you know, thought formula and ideas of what he wanted. Mm. He brought in, um, or brought down, I should say, quite a large contingent of Scottish players. 
again, you stick with what you know, I totally understand that. Um, we got back on track, I think, got into a playoff position, and obviously the Stockport debacle where just everything went wrong over those yeah. two games. The uh, Stephen Gleeson goal uh, for Stockport outside the edge of the box is still etched in my uh, yeah good my goal um, again the goalkeeper at the time I was still I still think he should have done a better job of saving it um, Frank Fielding has gone yeah. on to have a decent career in the championship um, but again that was just one goal conceded you know mm. I would never lambast the guy for for that but um, yeah it just didn't go right for us and shortly after Paul Lambert probably felt that he had taken the club as far as he could take them you know and he was probably homesick as well. I can understand that, so he just uh, resigned. Uh, but the plus side, he also took us to the League Cup semi finals. Yeah, again, absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's just what I said before the club has been spoiled in the last 25 years. We've probably done more in that time period than a lot of clubs have in the Football League in their entire history. Mm. We are spoiled, and a lot of the supporters do forget that. Yeah, um, and I certainly echo that, that as well. Um, Let's maybe backtrack. I, I sort of uh, overstepped the the mark by by missing out the the League Cup semi final um, and the League Cup run. What was um, what was the side like in your opinion? Good side and, and the season that we had. Good that side. Um, Stefan Oakes was in the middle. Great passer of the ball over distance. Could strike a ball. Again, how he never scored more goals from distance is just. A, a question mark that would mm. never be answered. Uh, Tommy Mooney was the, he was almost like the modern day Keith Scott. Master of the flick on. Yeah. Wonderful in the air, very intelligent football player, knew how to draw fouls and wasn't frightened to have a pop as well to strike a football. Jermaine Easter was a great foil for him, um, even though I know he has got a bit of stick lately. Um, he had a really good season that year and everything he touched seemed to go into the net. Um, and that side was a solid side and we really did some damage that year against some really good sides in the yeah. Premier League in that competition, Fulham and Charlton. Well, the, the Charlton and, and Chelsea goals were almost the same. Mm. Yeah, I, I, remember the, I remember the night up here very well actually. Um, Chelsea had a patched up side. Uh, they literally had yeah. half their team on the uh, that was when physio. Uh, mm. Czech and Kudacini both had... Yeah, uh, head uh, injuries. Um, I think Hilario might have been. Hilario was, was the goalkeeper. And, um, there's some youngster on the bench. I think, yeah, I think uh, Frank Lampard came on later in the game. Um, Chelsea were at odds that game. You could see, you know, good players can play anywhere. Um, and you could see their ability in their class. But um, the way we were set up that day, we went. We went into the game almost the opposite way we did against Liverpool in the other semi-final. We actually went at them and caused them problems. Yes, they did score yeah. first. Wayne Bridge scored. He was actually playing as a forward that day. And took out Ricardo Batista. Mm. Although, mm. again, Batista, um, very eccentric. Uh, I don't know why he came for that. He was never going to reach it. Um, Batista's another story, I think. But um, the... You know, we pressed on in the game, we got the goal we deserved and to, go, uh, to, to basically not get hammered in the first leg was the first port of call. We went to Stamford Bridge and we held our own for about 25-30 minutes. A couple of chances, ifs and buts, what would have happened if we'd have scored? But once they got their foothold in front and they had a much better organised side, they wiped the floor of us and showed their class. But to get that far... You know, it was fantastic. I reckon that possibly if the game um, was one game mm -hmm. against Chelsea, we'd have possibly gone through. One-offs. Because obviously the semi-final against Liverpool, like you were saying. Yeah, it's a one-off one game. You never know what can happen. And they always say, if you're going to do it, you do it in the first game. Even if we'd have won up here... You know, obviously they've still got the advantage at their place, and it's so tough. I mean, yeah, Chelsea. Us. You know, Ch Ch Chelsea were, you know, in the midst of their Abramovich, you know, spending spree. So you know, they were they were a, a universe yeah. away from what we were. And they, I think, they did have um, three or four of their players did actually return 
um, from injury for um, the next leg. So just it just was, so happened that we yeah. were we were the game that they were and able it was, to play. It was one of the few games that Andre Shevchenko actually showed the class that brought him to the club initially. Yes, he had a torrid time in England. It's amazing how we could do it against a League Two side, but yeah. not a. But that's you know, that's just uh, life, isn't it? Yeah. So um, same with Michael Ballack, I suppose. No. Who was uh, very heavily shown up in the first game of oh, yes. but um, a wonderful achievement and held our own against one of the best clubs in the country. Can't say yeah, bad things about definitely. it. All right then. Um, so let's let's fast track a little bit. Uh, obviously, we touched on it a little bit with um, Lambert resigning, um, and you, you sort of said, you're, "Is there anything more to add on?" It was very brief, so my memory is quite clouded, so it's not really much okay. else to add, apart from what we've said already. Of course. Um, now, the, the Peter Taylor era is where I catch up to you a little bit, mm -hmm. because this was the, the first season, where I was a season ticket holder, mm -hmm. was, and what a season to, to become a season ticket holder. Yeah. Um, the, the season... Obviously, I can I can elaborate a little bit more on it because I've 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 seen a lot of this um, a lot of this era from now or from the Peter Taylor era. When I when I first when I first thought about the um, the appointment of Peter Taylor, I knew who he was. Um, the first time I'd seen him was um, Leicester against Wickham, funnily enough, um, two thousand and one, when we beat his side in the Premier League. Um, uh, so I knew who he was. He was England under twenty one manager before coming to us, I think, um, if my memory serves correctly. Um, working with a lot of players who didn't make the grade in the first in uh, in the national squad. Um, but anyway, in terms of that season, what were your thoughts? Because there was quite a lot of players that came in, I think. Yeah. Um when he was appointed, I can't remember too much, but what I remember most is it was a very negative start of football. Um, two sitting midfielders in front of the back four, and we would look to scrape. It was like, almost like the old Arsenal way of playing, you know, scrape the one nil, mm -hmm. scrape the one nil, etc., etc. Um, we had a few players in there who, to me, just weren't up to standards. Even though we got promoted that year. I still think that was the worst League 2 I've ever seen. I mean, the team we've got now is so much better than that side. There was a lot of, there, is, there were a lot of teams in that division who aren't in league football anymore. No, I mean, which was very surprising. If, if you go back through the years, so many teams have fallen out of the league. Again, that's another reason where we should be so grateful we are where we are. Yeah. So many teams just fall out of the league and you never hear from them yeah. again. Darlington, Grimsby. Yeah, Chester, yeah, Hall Halifax, you know, yeah. Kidderminster, you know, the, the, the list is endless. Mm. You know, and only a few teams have gone down and come back up. Exactly. Yeah. Rovers, you know. Unfortunately, they've come back up. <laughs> um, of course. So, I, I sort of thought, obviously being still a young fan, um, great, we want promotion. Yeah. Um, as a young fan, I didn't didn't sort of oversee anything, um, overlook anything or overthink anything. So I just thought, wow, brilliant. Um, I was disgusted on the last game of the season. I was one of the few people to actually boo the side. Um, not the side in general, but the manager. Because we had set we had set up to not lose and hope that everyone else done us a favour, which I think rely is wrong. On other results, which I think is wrong. And And we did lose. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the way we set up, we encouraged them to come on at us, and we should have beaten Notts County. Because they, they had nothing, um, I think they were about 14th or 15th in the yeah. league, no chance of getting in top 10 even, weren't going to be relegated. They were basically playing for their futures yeah. and their contracts, but um, the, the, the way the game went, I just thought to myself, get, you know, get out your half and you know go at them. You know, if, if you're going to lose, you lose. But it's not to be a, a celebration day kind of. And you know, we, we, we went a goal down, and we just wouldn't come out of our half. And I was disgusted by it. And fortunately, results went our way, and we went up. But I just didn't agree with it. Yeah. And I thought to myself, well, if this is going to be our manager next season, in a higher division, and 
I know I got a bit of stick off a few people on the terrace, but I just felt that you know I was validated in my feelings because I want to come and see Wickham try and win a football match, you know, yeah. and I just thought it was like a cop out in the way it was set up. And the following yeah. season, we were just outclassed. Yeah, definitely. And um, we just become yeah. a yo-yo club. Towards the end of of our time in League One, um, Gary Woodock. Um, was sort of known um, by I, I sort of knew who he was. Um, yeah, he um, he had success at Older Shot. Um, so again, he's got that on his CV. So they bring him in. Very likable guy. Mm. Um, he, again, like we said before, he stuck with what he knew. So a big contingent of his Older Shot players would come over to us, and a lot of them did quite well. Yeah, some of them, you know, Nicky Ball would have been probably the outstanding yeah. person. Um, obviously, his you know leaving the football club under the circumstances he did points yeah. towards that you know he was upset when what a club you know left. Yeah. But again, that's not really for me to speculate. But um, there were one or two players who did come to us who just weren't up to up to the standard. John Halls, uh, now a model in uh, in a lot of fashion magazines, which you know. Yeah, all the power to him. He's made a neck, neck, another career for himself. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, the players who did come in just weren't up to it. And at the time, we didn't have as much money as we did a few years previous. Yeah. So he may have been hindered in that regard. But you know, Waddock just probably a step too far for him. Yeah. Nice guy. Um, Do you reckon if if he'd have had maybe a year with, or or even half a season with Oldershot in the football league? Then we'd have got after him. What would you think? What would you think about well, It's hard to say. I mean, the football club make their decisions based upon here and now. You know, um, yeah. you can't really hang around. And I suppose he was, he was so. successful. Yeah. Um, obviously, that on his CV, obviously, whoever was at the football club who made the decisions, that was good enough for yeah. you. You know, obviously, if you hold on looking for, you know, for them to follow through, someone, you know, you're standing still. You need to be yeah. going forward. So, you know, I don't have any discrepancies in that regard. You know, it, was, it was a very, very enjoyable time, sort of, the, the, the period that he was at the club. I mean, he got straight back up. Yeah, it was, much, the, it was more entertaining football. Uh, it was much more open, uh, you know, a world away from what Peter Taylor served up. Um, yeah. I think once we got into the division, he didn't really know how to sustain the club. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know his, his contacts sort of dried up a little. Yeah, bit, I was you know? I was going to say his contacts dried up. You know because he, he couldn't sort of see beyond the older shot connection. A conference manager, essentially. Or yeah, a, that's or not a, that's a league one manager with conference contacts, possibly. That's the thing. You know, that's not to say that he couldn't you know do the job higher yeah. up. But again, it's who you know, isn't it? And he was sort of bringing in. So he's come up from the conference using bringing conference players into league two, then. Bringing League Two players into a League One side, um, yeah. So he's sort of bringing players from the league below. It's a bit like Paul Lambert did when he was at Norwich. That's right, essentially. Yeah. But not with as much success. Yeah. Um, and then after, after sort of, possibly the worst period that I've I've seen the club in um, uh, was the. The anniversary year, the 125th anniversary year. Mm. Um, the way we were playing, some of the players we had didn't look like they were bothered. Um, no, um, and I thought it was horrible. I think the way the game is today, um, I'm going to be quite blunt about it. Footballers generally are what you would call modern-day mercenaries. You know, um, it's a world away from. The yeah. one league where you play for the badge, you play yeah. for the club. You know, obviously they're looking to make careers, and if they feel that their careers are stalling, I won't bother trying today. Yeah. But if we went into our jobs like that, we'd be shown the door. Yeah, exactly. Um, the players in general who appeared to be the clicker players, who were the troublemakers, eventually were moved on, um, and we did eventually start afresh. And Gareth Ainsworth has. Um, basically installed a philosophy of the football club which he wants his players to follow. And if you don't follow it, it's out the door out. and I'm all for it. I haven't got a problem with that. Which is essentially probably what he was brought up with when he was starting out. Sure. So, you know, 
and I think uh, on that subject as well, uh, the transition period between Gareth Ainsworth, the manager, uh, sorry, Gareth Ainsworth, the player, into Gareth Ainsworth, the manager, was probably a tough deal for him. Yeah. Um, I think when you're in any work situation where you're what you would call one of the boys, once you automatically step up to be a superior, you can't really speak to them without yeah. them sort of keeping straight faces. I think he you know? he actually came out and said that himself that when he was in caretaker charge or he was player manager that uh, players were looking over and they still saw the number seven or the number forty on his shorts. Mm. I thought, yeah. I mean, he's still, he's in, still in, in my work environment where we've had people promoted into positions, it is hard to, it's not done intentionally, but it's hard to give them the respect they deserve in their position. Kind of like your best mate being your boss. Yeah, it's, the, the, the dynamics are not right. Hmm. Uh, it's like when they said about Ryan Giggs stepping up to take over Man United, but yeah. the, the, the set of players there wouldn't be able to keep a straight face. You would have to go away first, yeah. learn your trade and then come back. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but he, he very successfully managed to turn the dynamic around and, as we said before, he's got a good philosophy here. All right. Um, very, very briefly, let's, uh, let's talk about... Um, Favourite memories of, um, of the club. Let's, let's pick one. Uh, one defining moment... Um, one of your favourite moments that you've, that you've encountered being The supported. conference winning, the last day when we won the conference, when the trophy was given to us, yeah. uh, I believe we actually lost that game. I think we only lost, that was like the second game we lost at home all season. Right. Um, but the title was ours and to be able to get that set of players to go one more season after the disappointment the year before when we joined yeah. 94 points with Colchester was a great achievement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a testament to the manager and the players. That would be the one thing that sticks out Brilliant. above everything else, including the cup runs. Yeah. Um, all right. What? Uh, just very one very very last question. Um, where would you see the club, or where would you like to see the club in the next five years? So if you had your own five-year plan. Ideally, the club exists, yeah. first and right. foremost. Okay. I would go and watch this football club on the rye against the dog and duck, providing it was still in existence. Yeah. That's the most important thing, above anything else. Um, where we are at the moment, um, in five years, I would like to see us as a club in the division above, where we don't have to worry about debt, and we could look to consolidate and look to move forward to try and get into the championship and then we see where we go Brilliant. from there. Okay, that's the interview uh, with Russell Thomas concluded. Um, obviously I'd, I'd just like to thank you again for thank first of very all much for having me. agreeing to come on um, and then second of all um, agreeing to, to become part of the, the growing uh, TV programme that is Chairboys 1887. So guys, uh, if you want to see more content Please subscribe to Moving On TV and uh, comment below if you have anything to ask. Thank you very much.